So we have our long form speaker coming up, our featured speaker. Today, I'm very happy to announce is Robert Egger. He is the president and the founder of the LA Kitchen. Um, he has so many great credits to his name, so I'm just gonna mention my favorite one, which he was named one of the top 10 most caring people by the Caring Institute. Pretty killer awesome. So I'd like to welcome to the stage now, Robert Egger. Thank you so much. Thanks so very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a big old fat pleasure to be here. Happy Mother's Day to everybody. Um, and I'm going to riff a little bit uh, on, on Sheila's thing about trying new things because, um, you know, it, it's interesting when you reflect on mothers. And I know we've all done that today. And, uh, you know, my mom could not carry a note to save her life, but boy, did she love making a joyful noise. We were, she was a church going woman. She dragged all six kids along with her. And as you can imagine, at a certain phase, I think many of us all went through it, I became less and less interested with going to church on Sunday. But nonetheless, you know, I wanted to make mom happy, so continued to go for a while, and eventually ended up uh, moving on in my, in my life to, uh, you know, moved out at home uh, uh, when I was 17, and I really wanted to open nightclubs. My mother uh, did something that really frustrated my father, and my father was a military pilot, and, and we had moved, we grew up here in Southern California, and we moved to Washington, D.C., and my pop you know, this was like the eighth move for our family. And, and my pop was always trying to sugarcoat these moves for us. And he was saying, in effect, oh, we're going to live in Washington, D.C. And he was really making it out like we were going to be at 1602 Pennsylvania Avenue. You know, we were going to be right next door. We were in Springfield, Virginia. It was like the Beverly Hillbillies in reverse. You know, it was a really, and to a young 13-year-old kid, it was really deeply frustrating. But I grew up here in Southern California dreaming of being a surfer. Two things I really wanted to be so bad I could spit. I wanted to be a hippie and I wanted to surf. I was 10 in 1968 uh, in Los Angeles here when Dr. King was assassinated and Robert Kennedy was assassinated. That had a profound impact on me. And it really set at a very early, early age a sense of, of what I wanted to do with my life. But like many people, I was still just kind of chugging along. But when we moved to Washington, D.C., my mom sat me down when we got there because I was really down. And she said, hey, there's one of my favorite movies come on, uh, coming on. Why don't we watch it together? And we sat down and watched the movie Casablanca. Now, it still remains one of my favorite movies, but it was interesting because literally as soon as Rick came on, as soon as you saw Rick's nightclub, it was, it was crazy because almost instantly I decided I want to be that guy and I want to open a nightclub. And that's all I ever did. I mean, my father used to shake his head and could not figure it out, but so suddenly that was like I had this sense of calling. I wanted to open the greatest nightclub in the world. Now, what was interesting about it is I didn't really want to do this for the obvious nightclub-y things. I became enamored as a young man with the power of music. You know, um, as much as um, people understandably look at the election cycle this year and think, oh, this is the worst cycle, elections have always been heinous. America's always been divided. In 1968 and, you know, 1972, they were always really tough years. Um, but I remembered vividly my father had a party once and all of their friends who could not agree on anything political and in particular were very, very mixed over their attitude about Dr. King and Robert Kennedy and other mo movements of the day, civil rights, the environmental movement, the women's movement. Yet, whenever my, my dad put on a Motown record, everybody danced. And as a kid, I became intrigued because the exact same ideas that got Dr. King and Robert Kennedy murdered got people on the dance floor. And I became mesmerized by the power of music, theater, comedy, art. So for me, a nightclub was about how can you keep these really important ideas moving forward? This was going to be my Trojan horse, this idea that you could lure people sometimes who were, in a sense, intrigued but afraid of bigger ideas. Somehow I felt this would be my way of keeping these very critical, important ideas moving forward, that I would have a nightclub and I would disguise really powerful ideas as entertainment. Oprah d did it every day. Oprah literally was a preacher. Oprah wanted your soul. But she disguised what she did as afternoon entertainment. She, she got people to believe that this wasn't an exercise in spirituality. It was just afternoon entertainment. And that's why she got it all under the radar. Now, I was a really good nightclub empresario. I had a great run. And I came up at a time when there was both an exciting 
time musically for new music, particularly in the late 70s and early 80s with the explosion of, I mean, it was everything. It was reggae, it was punk, it was sweet prints. You know, it was craft work and computer music. It was a glorious time. I also ran jazz nightclubs, and it was fun because I got to see, in fact, I was looking out, there's an old picture of Sarah Vaughan on the wall out there, and as a young man, I worked in jazz nightclubs where I got to meet and work alongside Sarah Vaughan, Oscar Peterson, Mel Torme, the modern jazz quartet. It was a great, fun life, and I was really, for sure set, this is, this is my, my chosen path. This is what I was born to do. I'm gonna open the greatest <laughs> nightclub in the world. And then, um, somebody asked me if I wanted to go out with a group of people and feed homeless people out on the street. Now, I know you're thinking, you know, oh, he's about to say, looked in the eyes of a homeless person, cast aside the stilly world of nightclubs. No, honestly, I'm a recovering hypocrite. You know, I should say, every time I say, hello, my name is Robert, and I'm a, because I spent my entire youth dreaming of changing the world with music. Yet, when somebody said, do you want to go out on the streets of Washington, D.C., and serve this rapidly growing ranks of people who were homeless, I said, no. I looked for every possible way to get out of it. You know, I was just afraid. Like so many people, I was burdened by the sense of stereotypes and bigotries, all the things that kept me from crossing this line of, of, of doing something not from the safe distance where you could you know, show empathy with your eyes as you walk by somebody, but to really get close and meet somebody. Like many people, there was a sense of, oh, I, I don't know if I could do that. So I looked for every excuse to get out of going out on this truck and inevitably I got pulled out. And it was interesting because I asked uh, to, to hide my nervousness, where's the food come from? And uh, they said, oh, we bought it at this grocery store. It happened to be the, the Safeway in Georgetown. I don't know any of you all know Washington, D.C., but it is the most expensive store on the planet. And I'm thinking, wow, that's interesting. I work in an industry that throws away food every single night. And not just nightclubs, but for heaven's sakes, uh, hotels, caterers, universities, hospitals. Wow, okay, so I'm thinking about that. But then it's fun to be up on this little riser because we ended up pulling up in front of the State Department on Virginia Avenue in between George Washington University and the State Department. And there was this long line of men and women outside waiting in the rain for this truck to pull up, just sitting there huddled up one by one in a dutiful little line waiting. And you know, I was looking out the window as we pulled up and we slid open this long window and dutifully started serving people. And as you can imagine, you know, all of my, my prejudices and stereotypes rapidly kind of faded away as we had conversations. And I was so intrigued by how many people I met uh, and the conversations we had, yet I couldn't help but have this nagging sense that I was the one being served. That I, in effect, I was up in the warmth of this truck serving people outside in the rain. And I kept looking, and, and not only that, but at the end of the line, the guy who was the driver of the truck seemed to know everybody by name and was saying, in effect, see you tomorrow night, see you tomorrow night, see you tomorrow night. And I kept trying to actually mind my own business. But at the same time, I just kept thinking about this equation, and I realized, you know, this is, um, this is kind of charity in America. This is, about, this is about the redemption of the giver, not the liberation of the receiver. And this was this moment in my young life where, you know, I thought, well, you know, I'm born to open a nightclub, but, you know, I, maybe I can put some things together here. And I, I, I went home that night and put together a little business plan. And it was based on FedEx, but it was this idea if you could get the restaurants and the hotels and the hospitals, farmers to donate food they hate throwing away, and you can bring it to a central kitchen, you can feed more people better food for less money. But should, let's get people off the street. You know, instead of viewing men and women out on the street as people who were only in need of services, maybe if we showed a way in which everybody had a role to play, that, that they could be part of a new solution. If we started a cooking school, we could offer those men a, ch a chance men and women to come off the street and be part of the solution. And in effect, we could not only serve the line better, but we could shorten it at the exa exact same time. And then, if you will, repay the restaurants and the hotels that gave us food with men and women who could come and work at their restaurants. So I was pretty proud of myself. I mean, this was a very small little idea, you know, idea and I kept dutifully going back uh, to all these different groups saying, I've got this great idea. Here's how you can feed more people better food for less money, da, 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 da. And I kept thinking that I was going to be given the Volunteer of the Year Award. I thought for sure that they would say, wow, how could we have missed this? This is such a great idea. Thanks. But you know what I heard over and over and over and over again was all the reasons it wouldn't work over and over and over again. It was so frustrating. And it was so interesting to watch how, many, how people worked so hard to keep 
this idea at bay, to the point of suggesting to me that while they appreciated the fact that I was young and, and idealistic, that was suggested that I was naive to think that restaurants would hire someone who was home from prison or who was an addict. Then I was like, <laughs> you've never worked in a restaurant. You know? <laughs> That's the island of misfit toys. Anybody can get a job in a restaurant. So, brothers and sisters, I had one of those moments, and we've all had them, where suddenly the road splits, and there's no sign that says polka dots and moonbeams this way, I'd turn back if I was you that way. It was just this moment where it's like, I was born to open the greatest nightclub in the world, but somebody should do this. You know, this is just too easy. It's not that hard. So I figured I'd get it going and push it off and go back to running nightclubs. Here we sit 30 years later. Um, and I've been doing this the rest since, ever since then. But what's been so interesting about it is not only have the businesses I've helped launch produced about 30 million meals over the past 20 some odd years and helped about 1,500 men and women go on to get jobs, but along the way, I discovered a lot of really interesting things. Um, a, it was fascinating, the model that I had touched on proved to be so much more interesting to people than I anticipated. You know, A, there was this intense curiosity about how much food we threw away, but what was even more interesting, and it started out, one of the very first, um, I opened up, we opened up on George Bush Sr.'s inauguration day. Who could resist? What media outlet, outlet in the world could resist food from uh, the inaugural parties going to homeless people the next day? And media from around the world came. It was fascinating because suddenly I had an onslaught of people who wanted to volunteer, right? So they started coming, and it was interesting because the very first time there was this group of doctors who wanted to volunteer as a group, right? And they came in, and we had this little ramshackle ch uh, kitchen we had set up on Florida Avenue, and we had one of our very first classes, and we were making this up. No one had ever really trained homelessness, homeless people before. So it was all made up as we went. And uh, I was sitting there trying to get these doctors and some of the men and women in the first class, and they were mostly men and women who had come out of heroin and alcohol abuse for many years. And I was so worried because I didn't think they'd figure out how, how to work together. And I was, try I had to run, I was doing everything back then, and I left, and I asked this one guy, Joe, can you get the, the, the men and women, the doctors going, right? And I, as I left and turned around, I looked at both groups and they were staring at each other, just kind of frozen in their tracks, just kind of staring at each other. And I realized, oh my goodness, this is trouble because both, both sides are afraid of one another. You know, to the doctors, Joe was a homeless guy with a knife. And to Joe, the doctors were people almost reinforcing his own sense of negativity about himself, the sense of, why am I trying this? I've messed up everything in my life. This is just something else I'm gonna mess up. And I was rushing around trying to get back. But when I came back, there they were all working together side by side, and Joe was teaching the doctors how to cut. And it was a fascinating moment when I realized this is how we'll fight hunger. It won't be about the food. It'll be about people working side by side. And that became our real agenda. You know, how could we get Washingtonians from all walks of life to come together? And this ended up culminating many times with the presidents and the first families coming to volunteer. You know, and here is Barack Obama and his entire family standing, and it was fascinating to see. Here we were in the basement of this giant shelter, and we were doing almost 7,000 meals a day, seven days a week. And there was, you know, a man who had been in prison most of his entire life. You know, a young kid who had been out on the street, an older person who wanted to volunteer. You know, somebody in our job training program, and the President of the United States, all standing side by side as Washingtonians. You know, this idea, if we work together, look at what we can achieve, but the power of someone in these moments, and it happened consistently, where the president would look over and say, am I doing this the right way? And the power of somebody who had been in prison looking over and saying, actually, no, you do it this way. You know, and that was the power of what we revealed, that everybody has a role, everybody has something to contribute. You know, and this is what really has led me on this journey and kept me really active, because what I discovered along the way is while it was important to address the, the issue of hunger in America, I became more and more intrigued by what I felt was this deeper hunger, this sense of, of, of this desire to be part of something bigger, this desire to belong, to feel like you were contributing to something. And it seemed to be universal. It didn't matter how metaphorically low somebody was or how high up they were. There was this great sense of longing that I became mesmerized by. And in, in actuality, what I discovered along the way is that the kitchen became my nightclub. And, and instead of music, I used food. And I could achieve the same thing. I could get people to these really interesting places where they could see in the simple act of working side by side 
um, the role we could each play, that in effect nobody was too far down to be redeemed and nobody was too high up to help somebody else up. And that's what I've done. Now I came back here to Southern California for two really very important reasons that I think are very germane to our conversation this morning. As you know from working with Westside, so many of the charities we work with, whether it do food, all that food represents lost profit. Industry, somebody bought it or grew it and they can't sell it, so they donated it. And it's become really, really pressing because for many of the food programs in America, there's this great sense of this food's not gonna be here forever. It's gonna go, it's gonna get, you know, people are getting smarter and smarter and smarter. So the food we have to rely upon is getting fewer and fewer and far between. And the food we do have oftentimes has sometimes really less nutritional content than many of us would like. So some of us started to really explore the idea of instead of waiting for food to be donated, what would happen if we went out to farmers early and offered to buy food? You know, instead of doing charity, we could open the door to business. You know, and once we did that, we could maybe then resell the food, we could open our own businesses. So when I left Washington, D.C., we were doing almost 12,000 meals a day, half for charitable partners, but the other half, locally sourced scratch cooked meals for D.C. public schools. Imagine men and women who were, who were serious, men and women who, actually, we started our businesses because there were so many men and women who were coming home from prison and nobody would give them a job, no matter how hard they tried. So that idea of let's start our own businesses, let's show people what men and women can do if you give them a chance. So we had an entire team of people, almost 50 people on the payroll who were serious men and women home from prison who were cooking every day and doing school food. And this, this amazing metamorphosis we saw constantly uh, of how people got really into the task. You know, this idea of I'm helping to repair a city I helped tear apart when I was younger. You know, the sense of, of ownership, the sense of meaning, it was so powerful to watch. But anyway, I came here back to Southern California because again, it's where I grew up. It's a great sense of return. I feel like the prodigal child after 40 years in the wilderness of Washington, D.C., I really wanted to come back to Los Angeles again. And again, there was two reasons. I mentioned food earlier. Coming here, you're at the bottom of the Central Valley of California. It's like the Niagara Falls of beautiful food. You know, every day in America, we throw away about 40% of the food we produce, but half of it is fruits and vegetables that are cosmetically imperfect. So this idea of coming back here and saying, I want to go get all the wrinkled, bruised, bent, broken produce that is currently thrown away and show it still has value. But what's equally interesting, as much as we sometimes really see Los Angeles as a town dedicated to youth, it's actually the largest concentration of older people in America. We have almost 1.25 million people over 65 here in Los Angeles. The number is going to double in 10 years to 2.5 million. And what you can see coming is a generation of people who are going to have longer than they have money in the bank. So I came back out here to be part of what I think is the next great food revolution. How can we feed a generation of older people a healthier meal? But not just feed them, but really reach out and include them. Our motto basically, wrinkled food, wrinkled people, no waste, you know? <laughs> But this idea of saying, you know, you're beautiful, you're needed, you have a role to play. You know, this is what interests me. You know, I tell you, man, I, you know, I look around, some of us in the room, we're all getting to that point, but wrinkles are the new tattoos, man. You know, they represent, a, you know, this, this, this thing that this is the last kind of great waste in America. We push away a generation. This, is, this represents, the baby boomers represent the deepest well of life experience in the history of the world. No other generation has been this rich, this free, this educated, and will have lived this long, and truthfully had the greatest soundtrack in the history of the world. <laughs> you know, and every single morning, 10,000 people wake up 70. Every single morning. And that's gonna go on for the next 18 years. And you gotta figure, there's a huge number of those men and women who are looking in the mirror and saying, how did I get so lost? You know, how did I get so tricked into thinking if I just bought more stuff, I'd be happy? And what I see is an army of men and women coming up saying, in effect, I have all this skill. I have still have some time. I have this love in my heart. Let me find a place, not to go back to the 60s, but to go back to that sense of belonging, to be part of something bigger. What's equally exciting is there's 100 million people under 30 in America, a generation, the most diverse generation in the history of our country, the most technologically advanced, but in one of the greatest social experiments in the history of the world, we raised an entire generation doing service. 
you know, going to volunteer at places like LA Kitchen or the West Side Food Bank or dozens of other places. You know, we send them off hoping they'll find some sense of place, but what's mesmerizing about them is what we've created as a generation, and I don't want to generalize, but a generation of young men and women who seem so convinced that they need to go out there and find a job that reflects not just, they almost want to merge their spirituality, their lifestyle, and their income. Saying in effect, look, if I can find a job where I not only don't do harm, I do good, sign me up. And that's a powerful, powerful opportunity. So what I see coming is a glorious moment where we can create a real bridge between generations. You know, how can we get old and young working side by side? You know, what was fascinating to me about California, and it happened all over America, but no more place, no place more poignantly than here. At the end of World War II, for the first time in the history of the planet, an army came home and didn't go back to the farm. That had never, ever happened. You know, rich people, Rich men declared war, and the sons and daughters of farmers went off to fight it. And those who were lucky enough came back home, and they went back to the farm. And that never happened before that this, through the GI Bill. And that's when we kind of left this agriculture, this sense of connectivity. And I don't want to romanticize that time, but what I find so mesmerizing is there's a younger generation that's trying to find their way back. And you see this all over, and whether it's farmers markets, whether it's the food movement, there's a sense of, of a longing to return to the sense of connectivity, but it's not about food. It's about community. It's about this deeper hunger that people have, where they want to feel like they're connected again, and they're working towards something really powerful. It's a glorious opportunity, and that's why I've come back to the city where the future comes to happen, to be part of making that happen, to show the power of using food purposely, but also using it in a way that uplifts, includes, empower, engages, and really says to people, you have a role to play. Old or young, everybody has something to contribute. Thank you all very, very much.